with the limitations clause. Makes sense. But how do you practically take something like that and apply it to a situation? Remember how we always talk about when things get complicated and we have these rules? We create more rules to help us uncomplicate things. So the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, and, and most case law, you'll see these precedents that set out the rules and the laws for us. So that the next time this comes up, the judge can go, where's that checklist? I gotta look at that checklist and I'm gonna, so I can be consistent. And they created this test. And they created a test in the R.V. Oaks case that said something like this. If we're going to look at a piece of legislation and say, hmm, that infringes someone's charter rights, the first question we're gonna ask ourselves is, does that legislation have as its objective a really, really important critical thing? And if it does, we're gonna say, okay, it's passed the first test. Now we're gonna move on to the next one, and we're gonna say, how exactly is the statute limiting someone's right and freedom? And they'll say, well, we gotta look at the way in which it's actually limiting it, and we'll look at whether or not there's any other way we could achieve the objective without trampling on someone's rights, and we'll try to make sure there's a balance between the measures we create and the actual objective of the legislation. And if we're gonna create infringements, they better help us meet the objective. They can't just be arbitrary and unfair. So before I talk to you about the Oaks case, I wanna give you a more simple example because as you all know, I have a 16 year old daughter, right? And if you don't know, you know now. And she used to be a lovely little thing. Right? She, she wanted to hang around her parents and she liked to converse with us and she wanted to go to grandma's house and we had conversations and then she turned 16 and she lives in the basement and we get grunts if we get anything, you know, and that's it. And I, you know, I'm going out of my mind. So I walked down the hall to a colleague of mine who's raised four teenagers who are, you know, married, have children and they're all wonderful human beings. And she said, Kathleen, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. You have to follow it. So, okay, what is it? She said, the only thing you have to do is keep her alive during the high school years. That's all your job is. You don't worry that she doesn't like you and she doesn't want to talk with you and she doesn't want to shop with you and she ducks down in the car when you drive by her friends. You never mind that. And you just keep her alive. Because let me tell you what, when she turns 20, she's going to be a lovely human being again. And she's going to talk to you and interact with you. And it's all going to be good. I said, okay, this sounds pretty easy. I can do this. So let's say I decide to enact a piece of legislation, and I'm going to appoint all of you to the Supreme Court of Canada to weigh in on the quality of my legislation, that says she's going to be locked in my house every day now so I can keep her alive. From 3.30 when she gets home at school till seven o'clock in the morning when she has to leave the next day. That's my legislation. Okay, Supreme Court justices, let's apply the test. First of all, do I have an important enough objective to pass a piece of legislation like that that very clearly overrides her rights and freedoms. What's my objective? Keeping her alive. Shame on you people nodding your heads no. That's not important enough, Kathleen. I think that's pretty important. So I know you're sitting there saying to yourself, that's unreasonable. Okay, and the courts might be able to do that too. So let's go to, let's assume for now, the Supreme Court of Canada, agrees with me and says, Kathleen, that's a very good objective, keeping your daughter alive until she becomes a nice person again. And, and I say, okay, good. But now you say, wait a minute. Now let's look at how you are actually infringing on her rights and freedoms. Why were some of you going like this when I said, is that, is that a good objective? Why don't you think it's reasonable or good for me to lock her up from 3.30 in the afternoon till 7 o'clock in the morning, Monday to Friday, maybe weekends? No, she has free reign in the house. Okay. Free reign in the house. So why is that unreasonable? Or you all think I'm good? What do you think, Brittany? Oh, well, like locking her up isn't going to help her like, um, like be social out in the real world, like she needs to be out there. And get along with others. So it could create some socialization problems from her. But let's think about my objective. I'm sorry, my objective is keeping her alive. Cassie? We'll go ahead, Ashley. 
No, I don't think she'd be, maybe she wouldn't be nice when she turns 20. But here's the thing, guys. Does that guarantee that she's going to stay alive if I lock her up like that? Will I achieve my objective? Okay, let's dump the social interaction. Let's talk simple things like the house could burn down, right? That does, she's inside the house locked. Failed to achieve my objective, not good, right? My other students were quick to point out, maybe she'd fall down the stairs. They thought of all sorts of horrible things that could happen to my daughter inside my house while I thought she was safe. Never mind the fact that from 7 a.m. till 3.30, she is still outside of my care and control. She's getting on city buses, she's going to school, she's interacting with friends. I can't monitor her 24 seven. So I am not likely to achieve my objective, first of all. Second of all, is the manner that I've chosen to limit her rights and freedoms as minimally impairing her as possible. Right? That's that proportionality test. Is it a big infringement or is it a little infringement? Where do you fall on the big little scale on this one, guys? It's huge. Think of being 16 years old and not being let out of your house. After school, the only thing in your life is school. Like, can we now get it over with, right? So it is not minimal. It's not minimal. And if you're going to trample on someone's rights, this clause isn't meant to allow people to trample with great big construction boots. It's meant, like, get your ballet flats on, and I need you to trample very lightly if we're going to allow this to happen. That's what that is. Okay, so that's a bit of a silly example, right, that really is extreme. And the courts, you know, don't have the benefit of